Book Ten, Part One of Plato's Republic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. C. Guan. The Republic by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Jowett. Book Ten, Part One. Of the many excellences which I perceive in the order of our state. There is none which upon reflection pleases me better than the rule about poetry. To what do you refer? To the rejection of imitative poetry, which certainly ought not to be received. As I see far more clearly now that the parts of the soul have been distinguished. What do you mean? Speaking in confidence, for I should not like to have my words repeated, to the tragedians and the rest of the imitative tribe. But I do not mind saying to you that all poetrical imitations are ruinous to the understanding of their hearers, and that the knowledge of their true nature is the only antidote to them. Explain the purport of your remark. Well, I will tell you, although I have always from my earliest youth have an awe and love of Homer which even now makes the words falter on my lips, for he is the great captain and teacher of the whole of that charming tragic company. But a man is not to be reverenced more than the truth, and therefore I will speak out. Very good, he said. Listen to me, then, or rather answer me. Put your question. Can you tell me what imitation is? For I really do not know. A likely thing, then, that I should know. Why not? For the duller eye may often see a thing sooner than the keener. Very true, he said. But in your presence, even if I had any faint notion, I could not muster courage to utter it. Will you inquire yourself? Well, then, shall we begin the inquiry in our usual manner? Whenever a number of individuals have a common name— we assume them to have also a corresponding idea or form. Do you understand me? I do. Let us take any common instance. There are beds and tables in the world. Plenty of them, are there not? Yes. But there are only two ideas or forms of them. One, the idea of a bed. The other, of a table. True. And... The maker of either of them makes a bed, or he makes a table for our use, in accordance with the idea. That is our way of speaking in this and similar instances. But no artificer makes the ideas themselves. How could he? Impossible. And there is another artist. I should like to know what you would say of him. Who is he? One who is the maker of all the works of all other workmen. What an extraordinary man! Wait a little, and there will be more reason for your saying so. For this is he who is able to make not only vessels for every kind, but plants and animals, himself and all other things, the earth and heaven, and the things which are in heaven or under the earth. He makes the gods also. He must be a wizard, and no mistake. Oh, you are incredulous, are you? Do you mean that there is no such maker or creator? Or that in one sense there might be a maker of all these things, but in another not? Do you see that there is a way in which you could make them all yourself? What way? An easy way enough. Or rather, there are many ways in which the feat might be quickly and easily accomplished. None quicker than that, of turning a mirror round and round. You would soon enough make the sun and the heavens, and the earth and yourself, and other animals and plants, and all the other things of which we were just now speaking, in the mirror. Yes, he said, but they would be appearances only. Very good, I said. You are coming to the point now, and the painter too is, as I conceive, just such another, a creator of appearances 
is he not? Of course. But then, I suppose you will say that what he creates is untrue, and yet there is a sense of which the painter also creates a bed? Yes, he said, but not a real bed. And what of the maker of the bed? Were you not saying that he too makes, not the idea which, according to your view, is the essence of the bed, but only a particular bed? Yes, I did. Then, if he does not make that which exists, he cannot make true existence, but only some semblance of existence. And if any one were to say that the work of the maker of the bed, or any other workman, has real existence, he could hardly be supposed to be speaking the truth. At any rate, he replied, philosophers would say that he was not speaking the truth. No wonder, then, that his work, too, is an indistinct expression of truth. No wonder. Suppose now that, by the light of the examples just offered, we inquire who this imitator is. If you please. Well, then, here are three beds, one existing in nature, which is made by God, as I think that we may say, for no one else can be the maker. No. There is another which is the work of the carpenter? Yes. And the work of a painter is a third? Yes. Beds, then, are of three kinds, and there are three artists who superintend them, God, the maker of the bed, and the painter? Yes, there are three of them. God, whether from choice or from necessity, made one bed in nature, and one only. Two or more such ideal beds neither have been, nor ever will be made by God. Why is that? Because even if he had made but two, a third would still appear behind them, which both of them would have for their idea. And that would be the ideal bed, and not the two others. Very true, he said. God knew this, and he desired to be the real maker of a real bed, not a particular maker of a particular bed, and therefore he created a bed which is essentially, and by nature, one only. So we believe. Shall we then speak of him as the natural author or maker of the bed? Yes, he replied, inasmuch as by the natural process of creation he is the author of this and of all other things. And what shall we say of the carpenter? Is not he also the maker of the bed? Yes. But would you call the painter a creator and maker? Certainly not. Yet, if he is not the maker, what is he? in relation to the bed. I think, he said, that we may fairly designate him as the imitator of that which the others make. Good, I said. Then you call him, who is third in the descent from nature, an imitator? Certainly, he said. And the tragic poet is an imitator, and therefore, like all other imitators, he is thrice removed from the king and from the truth? That appears to be so. Then about the imitator we are agreed. And what about the painter? I would like to know whether he may be thought to imitate that which originally exists in nature, or only the creations of artists. The latter. As they are, or as they appear, you have still to determine this. What do you mean? I mean that you may look at a bed from different points of view, obliquely, or directly, or from any other point of view, and the bed will appear different. But there is no difference in reality, and the same of all things. Yes, he said, the difference is only apparent. Now let me ask you another question. Which is the art of painting designed to be? An imitation of things as they are, or as they appear? Of appearance, or of reality? Of appearance. Then the imitator, I said, is a long way of the truth, and can do all things because he lightly touches on a small part of them, and that part, an image. 
For example, a painter will paint a cobbler, carpenter, or any other artist, though he knows nothing of their arts. And, if he is a good artist, he may deceive children or simple persons, when he shows them his picture of a carpenter from a distance, and they will fancy that they are looking at a real carpenter. Certainly. And whenever any one informs us that he has found a man who knows all the arts, and all things else that anybody knows, and every single thing, with a higher degree of accuracy than any other man. Whoever tells us this, I think, that we can only imagine him to be a simple creature, who is likely to have been deceived by some wizard or actor whom he met, and whom he thought all-knowing, because he himself was unable to analyze the nature of knowledge and ignorance and imitation. Most true. And so, when we hear persons saying, that the tragedians and Homer, who is at their head, know all the arts and all things human, virtue as well as vice, and divine things too, for that the good poet cannot compose well unless he knows his subject, and that he, who has not this knowledge, can never be a poet, we ought to consider whether here also there may not be a similar illusion. Perhaps they may have come across imitators, and been deceived by them. They may not have remembered, when they saw their works, that these were, but imitations thrice removed from the truth, and could easily be made without any knowledge of the truth, because they are appearances only, and not realities. Or, after all, they may be in the right, and poets do really know the things about which they seem, to the many, to speak so well. The question, he said, should by all means be considered. Now do you suppose that if a person were able to make the original as well as the image, he would seriously devote himself to the image-making branch? Would he allow imitation to be the ruling principle of his life, as if he had nothing higher in him? I should say not. The real artist, who knew what he was imitating, would be interested in realities, and not imitations, and would desire to leave as memorials of himself works many and fair, and, instead of being the author of encomiums, he would prefer to be the theme of them. Yes, he said, that would be to him a source of much greater honour and profit. Then, I said, we must put a question to Homer, not about medicine, or any of the arts to which his poems only incidentally refer. We are not going to ask him, or any other poet, whether he has cured patients like Asclepius, or left behind him a school of medicine such as the Asclepiads were, or whether he only talks about medicine and other arts at second hand. But we have a right to know respecting military tactics, politics, education, which are the chiefest and noblest subjects of his poems, and we may fairly ask him about them, friend Homer. Then we say to him, If you are only in the second remove from truth, in what you say of virtue, and not in the third, not an image-maker or imitator, and if you are able to discern what pursuits make men better or worse in private or public life, Tell us what state was ever better governed by your help. The good order of Lacedaemon is due to Lycurgus, and many other cities, great and small, have been similarly benefited by others. But who says that you have been a good legislator to them, and have done them any good? Italy and Sicily boast of Carondus, and there is Solon, who is renowned among us. But what city has anything to say about you? Is there any city which he might name? I think not, said Glaucon. Not even the Homerids themselves pretend that he was a legislator. Well, but is there any war on record which was carried on successfully by him, or aided by his counsels when he was alive? There is not. Or is there any invention of his, applicable to the arts or to human life, such as Thales the Milesian, or Anarchasis, 
the Scythian, and other ingenious men have conceived, which is attributed to him? There is absolutely nothing of the kind. But if Homer never did any public service, was he privately a guide or teacher of any? Had he, in his lifetime, friends who loved to associate with him, and who handed down to posterity any Homeric way of life, such as was established by Pythagoras, who was so greatly beloved for his wisdom, and whose followers are to this day quite celebrated for the order which was named after him? Nothing of the kind is recorded of him, for surely Socrates, Creophilus, the companion of Homer, that child of flesh, whose name always makes us laugh, might be more justly ridiculed for his stupidity, if, as is said, Homer was greatly neglected by him and others in his own day when he was alive. Yes, I replied, that is the tradition. But can you imagine, Glaucon, that if Homer had really been able to educate and improve mankind, if he had possessed knowledge and not been a mere imitator, can you imagine, I say, that he would not have any followers, and been honoured and loved by them, Protagoras of Abdera and Prodicus of Ceos, and a host of others, have only to whisper to their contemporaries, you will never be able to manage either your own house or your own state until you appoint us to be your ministers of education. And this ingenious device of theirs has such an effect in making men love them that their companions all but carry them about on their shoulders. And is it conceivable that the contemporaries of Homer, or again of Hesiod, would have allowed either of them to go about as rhapsodists, if they had really been able to make mankind virtuous? Would they not have been as unwilling to part with them as with gold, and have compelled them to stay at home with them? Or, if the master could not stay, then the disciples would have followed him about everywhere, until they had got education enough. Yes, Socrates, that, I think, is quite true. Then must we not infer that all these poetical individuals, beginning with Homer, are only imitators? They copy images of virtue and the like, but the truth they never reach. The poet is like a painter, who, as we have already observed, will make a likeness of a cobbler, though he understands nothing of cobbling, and his picture is good enough for those who know no more than he does, and judge only by colours and figures. Quite so. In like manner, the poet, with his words and phrases, may be said to lay on the colours of the several arts, himself understanding their nature only enough to imitate them, and other people who are as ignorant as he is, and judge only from his words, imagine that if he speaks of cobbling, or of military tactics, or of anything else in metre and harmony and rhythm, he speaks very well. Such is the sweet influence which melody and rhythm by nature have. And I think that you must have observed again and again what a poor appearance the tales of poets make when stripped of the colours which music puts upon them, and recited in simple prose. Yes, he said. They are like faces, which were never really beautiful, but only blooming, and now the bloom of youth has passed away from them. Exactly. There is another point. The imitator or maker of the image knows nothing of true existence. He knows appearances only. Am I not right? Yes. Then let us have a clear understanding, and not be satisfied with half an explanation. Proceed. Of the painter, we say that he will paint rains, and he will paint a bit? Yes. And the worker in leather and brass will make them? Certainly. But does the painter know the right form of the bit and rains? Nay, Hardly even the workers in brass and leather who make them. Only the horseman knows how to use them. He knows of their right form. Most true. End of Book 10, Part 1 
Recording by J. C. Guan, Montreal, December two thousand and eight.